On the bucolic campus of Colby College in Waterville, Maine, sits the school's art museum. Recently and vastly expanded with a 26,000 square foot glass pavilion, it's intended to be a beacon. This metaphor of the lantern or the beacon was one that we kept going back to. And um, having this be a place that one was drawn to by the light that it emits and, um, and, and then metaphorically by the kind of the, the creative, the, the artistic illumination that can happen in these spaces. Now resolutely glowing from within is the museum's staggering permanent collection. A robust representation of American art populated by the country's most profound painters and sculptors. Heavy on Whistler, punctuated by Sargent, enticing with O'Keefe, and made contemporary by cats. It will transform this community, and I'm, I'm already seeing it happen. I think people in our community are coming to the museum now. I think they have taken real ownership of this collection and of the, these new spaces. All of this, every piece you've seen here, is new to Colby. Until recently, it was the private collection of Maine couple Peter and Paula Lunder. And now they have gifted all of it, more than 500 objects valued at more than $100 million, to Colby. Dream was always that it would be shown. And uh, with the uh, students and the uh, tourists and the state could uh, enjoy it as much as we did. And we have full confidence in Colby that they will really take this collection and make an impact within the curriculum and for the community. With the Lunder gift and the new wing to showcase it, virtually overnight the Colby College Museum of Art has become the largest art museum in Maine. The Lunder strategy was simple. Colby is a neighbor, it is Peter Lunder's alma mater, and the couple wanted to provide an otherwise underserved community exposure to art. Feels wonderful that they're responding to it the same way we did. The collection began with a series of antique store visits when the Lunders first moved to Maine more than 40 years ago. They quickly noticed they were drawn more to the art. It just evolved in uh, yeah. paintings and sculptures and objects, uh, whatever. Uh, if we liked it, uh, then we uh, got some advice and then ended up buying it. The collection grew, initially with Peter's passion for southwestern pieces. And when it became apparent that the couple was assembling a museum-worthy collection, they began using advisors. But their philosophy for purchasing was straightforward. No boundaries. Pure, pure emotion. So we would speak to other collectors and they would say, you have to focus. Some of them would say, you must focus. Well, that's not Peter and I. <laughs> We don't, as you can see, <laughs> but we enjoy it. We love it all. But not always at once when it came to buying. No. You didn't have to agree. No. Two different she people, had, you can't. She had, really uh, Paula had strong feelings on something. I may not have liked it as much, but uh, I yielded to her eye and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Who knows whether uh, who's right or who's wrong in a exactly. situation, so... There is no right or wrong. What there is is a lasting and substantial shift on the main arts landscape from a couple who ultimately spent much of their personal lives in service to a community they love. But lest you think their own walls are now devoid of art... There's plenty of backup at home. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, and Jerry Bowen is here. That is really terrific. I mean, they're so genuine. They want everybody to see what they saw, then they had, and they collected. Yeah, it's really incredible. And I, I should say, just they're the most, they're the nicest, most down-to-earth people. They were always reluctant to give interviews because they, they don't want any of the fame. They don't want any glory. They just, when they realized they were amassing this collection, they realized that this would be best served in, for Colby. This is a collection with so many stunning pieces of art. I mean, I was just floored as I toured the, the permanent collection there that it could go to any major museum, any institution, and it would transform any other one as well. But they wanted to make sure that this art was going to be shown, and that's why they didn't give it to an MFA or a Met you know, in New York or something like that. The, the agreement with Colby is this will be out. It won't go into the basement. It won't be stored and trotted out every now and again. But this is something that will be there for the community. And admission to Colby, I might add, is free. So this is a wonderful addition. To admission that. to the museum. Admission, yeah. Not to the college, but yeah, admission to the museum is free. And they work, they work with the public school system there. 
there, so it's part of the Colby College curriculum, it's part of the local school system, and just the day that I was there, which is a few weeks after it opened, uh, people were flocking to that museum. It was quite uh, substantially filled. I love the fact that this collection is so eclectic, because um, Peter, anyway, said, oh, people were always telling us we should focus, 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 but it, as they both said, there's no boundaries, so what is that thing, an eraser, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is from the, the contemporary art wing, and this is what I loved. I mean, this is a couple that collected very passionately American art. That, that was probably their only boundary. But they really did collect with emotion. And they thought um, quite passionately, passionately and intellectually about pieces. And some of these pieces, they told me, it took a year to decide whether to purchase. And then when they started working with Colby and they realized this collection would go there, they started working with Sharon, the, the museum director. And they were very open to collecting contemporary pieces. And then you have this you know, great Solowit piece that, that uh, is for yeah. the outside of the building. Um, so they were very, very open. And so you have everything from the late 1700s all the way to pieces that are being done now, including one piece you remarked on, which is a video piece, which Peter Lunder showed me they're very, very excited about. And how does that work? Is it, it, it interactive? You well, no. You just you just stand in front of it. it. Looks like it's it's white on canvas, and then there's a digital video projection, and it looks like you're looking at snow. And then all of a sudden, the skier starts to tromp through. He's cross country skiing. It's really a compelling piece. Mm -hmm. So the, he said he's got plenty of backup. <laughs> that's that's I a, love that, that. It, it, that's amazing. Because if he gave 500 pieces, they gave. They've got. Their, their walls are not empty. Yeah, no, no, I, I, yeah. There's somebody, there are people, and this is what I love too, they appreciate art. They know what art has done for their lives. And it's also very interesting that she grew up in Chicago going to the Art Institute. He grew up in Boston. His aunt's taking him to the Boston Museum. But art wasn't infused in their lives. It's something they found themselves gravitating yeah. toward, and, and, and it just evolved within them, and it became part of their family as well. If anybody's curious, he made his money in Dexter shoes. Yes. So. <laughs> All right, Jerry Bowen, that was great. Thanks so much. All right, and that does it for Greater Boston tomorrow night. She waited 30 years for justice, and on Monday, she got it. We're joined by Teresa Bond, three days after a jury convicted Whitey Bulger in her father's murder. Plus, Gail Huff climbs aboard a historic shark-tagging expedition off the Cape Cod coast. Find out if she got any bites tomorrow at 7. I'm Emily Rooney. Thanks for watching.